Hello mammals, my name is Ben Woodruff and I'm excited to start today's presentation. Uh, this is very unusual for me, not the format I'm used to for the Great Salt Lake Bird Festival. And I, I'm used to enjoying being able to get up and, and have fun with all of you. So this is very different for me. Um, but it also provides some opportunities where I can show a lot of video clips that I wouldn't maybe normally be able to do if I was just standing up there holding a bird. Uh, this presentation is going to be on Harris Hawks, which is a very exciting species. I understand that there might be some of you who are like, Excuse me, sir. And according to my field guide, it says Harris's Hawk, not Harris Hawk. Ah, I understand that. Um, Harris Hawk or Harris's Hawk is a common name. And so really, when it comes to common names, as opposed to proper Linnaean uh, classification, it's kind of what people say. If the vast majority of birders started started calling them uh, grasshopper hawks or monkey hawks or badger hawks, and that was what everybody was calling them, it's like, eh, okay, that's a common name, sure, whatever. Of course, the scientific name is where you gotta stick to your rules. The circles that I run in, in falconry and uh, wildlife rehabilitators, wildlife educators, uh, most of us use the term Harris Hawk. And so in this presentation, old habits die hard. So so if you're a Harris's and not Harris type person, please forgive me and I appreciate your patience. Uh, the species, uh, the Harris Hawk, was named after the common name Harris Hawk was given by James Audubon, who named it after his friend, Edward Harris, who uh, was also a financial supporter of his. And so that's where it's it's Harris's hawk, because it's Edward Harris's hawk. I named it after him. So that's kind of where that came from. This is a really interesting species when it comes to actual classification. What on earth is it? Uh, the, the scientific name is Parabudio unisinctus. Now, Parabudio, para means like uh, similar to, false, copy of, a budio. Now, budios, as we know, what they really are, uh, are the, the, the term that all the rest of the world uses, except for the people in the United States, is buzzard. For whatever reason, that old redneck side of us here in America in the early days, buzzard came to kind of mean vultures, which is very strange because buzzards are what all the rest of the world calls uh, is the common term for budios. Budios are your soaring hawks. So these, the most common probably that people see is the red-tailed hawk, right? Or uh, also the ferruginous hawk. And these are birds that are really broad-chested, strong muscles. Their wings are typically very long, uh, very broad, and their tails are usually pretty long too. Their legs are comparatively short. Their toes are comparatively short and thick. Uh, they're basically built like a like a truck. They're rawr, you know, they're just kind of these burly, not the fastest things, right? So Parabudio unisinctus is the hawk that is similar to, but not quite, a budio. So that's our current uh, taxonomy of the bird is how how we list it. Is that it's not a budio, but it's you know maybe kind of similar. If you think of this bird it doesn't really match anything else. It's definitely not a budio. It's built, uh, like the silhouette, the structure, is far more like an occipiter. Now, occipiters are normally your forest hawks. In America, we have the goshawk, cooper's hawk, sharpshin hawk. Uh, all of these species, the occipiters, have uh, short, rounded wings uh, that are very broad, extremely long tails for maneuverability, long uh, legs, and they're, they're very kind of skinny and, and um, gangly, very gangly is, is our occipiters. And it is true that uh, Harris hawks, even though their silhouette is a bit more like an occipiter, they really are kind of halfway in between in their shape. Because even though their wings are short, they're not as short as an occipiter. Um, and even though they are kind of gangly, kind of wiry, not quite to the level of an occipiter, they are still a, a bit burly, more than a, than a goshawk of similar dimensions. So, wh so what are they? Um, they're actually an eagle. And I know. Bear with me. We're going to get into this in a second on who they're really related to, and some of the most up-to-date uh, DNA studies that have come up of where. This, this particular bird branches off in the family tree. 
uh, and it's, it's going to surprise you. Before we jump into the taxonomy and who the closest relatives of the Harris hawk are, uh, we're gonna, let's talk a little bit about where it lives so that we have a better understanding and it'll actually be a clue. Most people who are aware of Harris hawks at all, if you say Harris hawk, you instantly picture saguaro cactus country. Almost everybody, they picture, oh yeah, Arizona and, and packs of Harris hawks roaming around landing on cacti, and, and which is true, they do live there, but that's the extreme northern end of the range of the Harris hawk. Harris hawks live, you know, barely in Arizona and Texas, on south into Mexico, Central America, and deep south into South America. And they have a rich history there, not only in the wild, but with humans. When you say Harris hawk, very few people picture rainforests. But in truth, uh, the jaguar filled forests really are where you have far more Harris hawks than you do in their extreme northern range. And it's kind of interesting because some of the uh, Spanish accounts encountering Aztecs and Mayan people, uh, particularly the Aztecs, Zapotecs, um, show that they were keeping. Harris hawks, and as well as Oplomato falcons. Now, what they did not record was if they were using these birds for falconry. In South America and Central America, among native peoples, there are rich heritages of, of keeping animals as sort of pets. Uh, from from for totemic or spiritual reasons or just hey it's fun to keep different animals around you in the tribe and if we do not know then if all the way to the grand level of the aztec empire if that was what was going on if it was we're doing falconry or these are spiritual animals to be kept or if it was just like ah we're keeping around they're noble they're fun we're just keeping them kind of like an exotic pet we do not know that we can only speculate. Now, I know the images I have in here are not of Aztec ruins, but of Mayan ruins, but the uh, capital of the Aztec Empire has Mexico City now built over the top of it, so kind of can't show those ruins anymore. But it, but it is interesting to note. Now, a side note on that. Even though Harris Hawks and Oplomato Falcons were kept at the Aztec capital and were noted and described uh, by the Spanish, the Oplomatos are the only ones that really caught their attention of the Spanish. And Oplomatos were actually, for, for a brief period of 100, 150 years, were shipped from Mexico all the way to Spain and then were sold uh, to the royalty of Europe, particularly France, for use in, as a falconry bird. And they called it an Aleth. Falcon, that's what the Spanish called it. But it's kind of kind of a strange, interesting chapter when you think about, you know, Mexican Oplomato falcons being flown in Spain and France during basically the Renaissance. It's very unusual. We don't know why they did not do that with Harris hawks. And as a falconer, I can say that would have changed falconry the entire world over hundreds of years earlier. Because we'll get to falconry in a bit, but the Harris hawk has revolutionized the art of falconry and it, it could have done it worldwide much earlier if they had of uh been shipping them over and breeding them but so we know harris hawks were kept by the aztecs and we know the spanish took note of that so we know that they had this human interaction in these uh in these desert and tropical areas but again harris hawks range all over the place from arizona deep into south america one of the things they are most famous for is being pack hunters. And I will get more into that in a minute. But one thing I want you to do is to remember that the level to which they hunt in a pack is largely dictated by where they live. It has been observed by biologists that Harris hawks that, that, that are in extreme hyper tropical areas with enormous biological productivity, food everywhere, uh, are far more apt, uh, apt to just be a pair. Hey, we're a mated pair. Yeah, we might hunt together a little, but we're catching lizards in the trees and stuff. We we don't need to, you know. And the more arid it gets, you know, when you, these Arizona and Texas birds, then you see the absolute profusion and heightened manifestation of their pack hunting ways. And I will get into that in a little bit, but I just want to make mention that even though this species can can cover an enormous range, um, that it that it, that it, it, it that it can adapt, the pack hunting thing is 
seems to be more of a desert, a, a desert adaptation. Harris hawks themselves, when they are in cactus country, have an interesting dilemma. Because you have a bird that originates, and I'll, I'll explain when we get into taxonomy here in just a minute. Uh, they're, they're, um, they are built for jungle life. They're built to be able to land, have trees everywhere, perches everywhere, always a place to land. And now you're like, oh, we're in the desert. Where do we land? There's a cactus. Would you want to be barefoot on a cactus? <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, they don't have a choice. And of course, there are many desert birds that, that do that. But this is not originally a desert bird. So the interesting thing is the, uh, the, the Arizona and Texas Harris hawks are very dainty, gentle perchers. Uh, normally, just so you know, if, you, if you've never held a hawk before, hawks of any kind, when they're making a kill or grabbing onto food, they're, they're doing their full grip. When they're not doing that, they're not gripping full grip, but they'll have some grip. They'll have a little bit. You, you know, they're, they're, they're pushing a little, holding onto their perch. These northern Harris hawks are not that way. The ones from cactus country are not that way. They are, if they're not gripping dinner, then they are totally gentle. When I'm doing presentations live, I'll show, look, I can hold a Harris hawk on my bare skin. No problem. It's not hurting me. Might poke a little, but they're not digging in in any way, shape, or form. And again, that is an adaptation for being able to stand barefoot on a cactus. Now, when they're, because we already mentioned Harris hawks are pack hunters, if you have an entire pack pursuing prey and diving in and out of cacti, and then the prey whoom, goes under a bush and it's like, oh, where'd it go? Whoom, 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 whoom. They all go up to the nearest cactus. If you have a pack of potentially as many as 20 Harris hawks on a big pack, usually it's more like five to nine, but you can have as many as 20, where are they all gonna perch? You're gonna run out of spaces on a cactus really fast. So they will perch on top of each other. Uh, usually two, but as many as three birds up, totem pole style. Which is, it's nutty to see it. Trained Harris Hawks will do the same thing. And uh, it's a way, hey, we're out of space, so we're going to land on you. They will also do that in, in falconry and education. They land on people because it's still the same behavior. So you might be walking along and they'll land on your shoulder, land on your head, which is, it's crazy. Uh, I don't encourage that behavior personally. Uh, I think it's a, a recipe, a potential recipe for disaster. I don't want a bird just thinking, hey, I can land on somebody's head anytime. I, I have, my Harris Hawks are always trained to fly back to my truck when I'm done hunting with them. I'll just be like, and they're following, following, following. I'm like, go to the truck. They'll find it and they'll go land on a wait. I'm okay with that. Uh, but some people uh, encourage that behavior. I have a friend in England who has a very, uh, very successful show that he does and people love it. And what he'll do is he's, and he takes the talons and he'll just take a little sandpaper, make sure they're not razor sharp. And he'll just walk around and have the Harris Hawks land on people. And he tells them ahead of time, but on his website, he's got a picture of this bald guy, you know, with the Hawks in it. And, goes, uh, and again, that's fine and dandy. In my opinion, though, it, it, it's always good to keep a hawk's talons sharp because they use it as part of their eating process. So I think it's more important the health of the bird than um, an educational opportunity like that. But the point is that Harris hawks will land on people if they think that you are their pack. They have no problem doing that and following along in that way. So um, the, when they're when they're hunting in packs, the, the Harris hawks that are more prone to do that again are the are the more northern branch of the population, the more desert branch of the population. We know that the, uh, the evolutionary forces will shape and streamline a species, okay? This is why you see certain shapes appear again and again and again. This is why an ichthyosaur looks so much like a dolphin, right? Certain shapes work well, certain proportions work well, certain bone densities work well. And so we, we see a lot of uniformity. You might see differences in color, but normally within raptors, you know, take a look at your field guide. If you open up your field guide and you read, what are the sizes? The wingspan is eh, between this to this of this species. Oh, the, the length is between eh, this, the weight is, eh, you know, the range is not very big. Evolution usually shapes things in that way. So it's, so it's, uh, it's pretty reliable. 
your field guide will say that about Harris Hawks, but it's not accurate. If both with captive bred Harris Hawks as well as wild ones, especially with wild ones, there is a radical range of diversity in size, shape, bulkiness, strength, loudness, and there is a proliferation of what we would almost call limitations or disabilities. A proliferation. Nature eliminates those normally, not with Harris Hawks, because they are pack hunters, because they work together. So if they're going after prey, it's fascinating to watch because as the young grow, you, you, with all raptors, raptors grow incredibly quickly. They're full size within a couple months. Uh, but when they're hunting, these new birds, they're terrible at hunting. The parents have to train them because there's a lot of instinct, right? There's a lot of, we know there's instinct in nature and we know some raptor species will do the basics of teaching. For example, a goshawk or a cooper's hawk. When you have a baby reach the age where it's jumping around the tree, it'll sleep in the nest, but it's jumping around the tree and, and, and it's waiting for mom and dad to come. And mom and dad at that age will catch prey, but not kill it. They'll injure it and they'll fly near and the, the and call and the babies will come flying over and they'll drop this wounded animal and their babies will try to catch it. Or even if it's on the ground, they'll feel the poor prey animal screaming and wiggling. Really gross, of course, really, but that's nature. Now that's entry level training. That's what a fair number of raptors do. Harris hawks do it entirely different. Harris hawks teach, look, we're going this way. Look, you're coming with us on the hunt. And a lot of Harris Hawks, once they've made the kill, they, the, the, the parents, are kind of the alphas, the leaders of the pack, will let those first year members of the pack come in and feed. It's like, look, we trained you. You see the benefit? You work with us. And we work together. We have success. We all get food. It works wonderfully. And this is part of the reason why Harris Hawks do so well in falconry because it's the same principle. Falconry is not owning a bird. Falconry is not teaching a bird how to hunt. Falconry is building mutual trust and working together for a common goal. But how do you teach a bird to do that? Well, Harris Hawks already understand. There's kind of that wiring and you just show them the basics. Hey, look, we're working together. They're like, I like this. Yeah, let's go hunting together. So back to what I was saying about some of those limitations that get proliferated. In a pack-like setting, there are a lot of benefits to having a lot of oddities. So for example, let's say you have a hunt. Let's say, I don't know, cottontail rabbit. It goes flushing and it's running. Now, maybe the loud mouth, it's always squawking. Everybody's like, oh, hey, he's squawking because he sees something. Everybody go. And then maybe you have one or two that are the shrimpiest. Uh, and they're brr, brr, they're the fastest. Da, 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 da. They're on the chase. Do, 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 do. And they're super agile. They catch this rabbit. You know what? I'm going to scale it up. Let's say a jackrabbit. Let's say it's a jackrabbit because for my example, I want something a little bigger and stronger. So they catch this jackrabbit. They get it. We got it. Um, but then along the way, they're going to get bucked off of this jackrabbit because it's so big and they're so little. They caught it, but they can't hold on. And so then maybe you have some of the bigger ones come loping along. They're, they're much larger comparatively than they should be, and they help grab the rabbit. And then maybe finally you have a very experienced bird that comes in last and it knows the proper place to grab to dispatch prey. So everybody help. So there is a benefit to having a wide range of size, a wide range of this one's way vocal, this one's really quiet. Uh, just there is an advantage to all of that. But along the way, if you are going to not eliminate, but rather proliferate a wide range of mutagens, of, of genetic expressions, of size and, and sound of vocalizations, you will also, in the process, uh, have negative traits that'll just appear and get passed on. Uh, and so it is very common to see Harris Hawks. Well, okay, two biggies, two biggies. You, if you're looking at a wing, you know, you've got your Alula, you got your primary, so you got your secondaries. There is a, 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 a genetic sequence out there in Arizona where the first three primaries on one wing don't exist and never did. And it's usually the right wing. We see that time and time again. So you got this lopsided Harris Hawk and it's still, but it lives because it's doing its part. It's part of the team. It shares in the kill. 
just like wolves. So even if it's maybe lower on the totem pole, it's still getting dinner. The other one we see that is very common is on the feet, missing toes, missing a toe or two. Born that way, or sorry, hatched that way. I can't believe I said born. I always give people a hard time about that. So that is strange. You would not have that because what's the rule of nature? Survival of the fittest. You're not the fittest, you don't survive. But with Harris Hawks, this pack mentality helps a wider range of diversity survive. And you think about it, we're, we're very similar, right? That's one of the things I like about Harris Hawks. Humans, now I know we also have a capacity to be, a capacity to be terribly self-centered, uh, self-interested and, and, and jealous and mean, but we do have a capacity to do good, to help those in need, to look out for those. And you think about survival, if it was just survival of the fittest, I have contact lenses. I am so blind, it's not even funny. There's no way I would survive. But we have said, uh, oh, well, people matter and a life matters. And you know what? We're gonna let you have contacts and try to help you have a, as normal as a life as you can. Now, obviously, Harris Hawks aren't doing things to that level, but we benefit from a social mentality just like Harris Hawks do. And because of that, well, not because of that, in part because of that, with humans, we see a wide range of diversity of sizes and shapes and thinking and beard growth levels and all that stuff. Same thing, same thing with hair socks. Same thing. We see a much, if you actually get out there in the field and are observing them or trapping them, banding them, you see a ridiculous diversity of sizes and shapes, even though they're the same species. So that's kind of interesting. Now in the field also, if you're out there looking, uh, pack mentality, watch for this. If you ever go, especially the Arizona ones, it's fun to watch, uh, look closely. They love to have toys. Maybe to the level of kind of like a dog or a wolf likes to have something to play with, chew on, that they'll carry with them. Uh, around, so usually it's a stick, sometimes it's a rock, where one of them will have their favorite stick and they're kind of playing with it, uh, similar to a raven or a crow magpie, you know, it's like, oh, but not fully to that level, but a little bit. They have a playful side. No, oh, this is fun to play with and foot and they'll throw it and go catch it themselves like a cat. But then they will carry it with them if the pack is moving. Oh, wait, we're hunting. They put it down and they will often come back and get it. Highly unusual behavior for a raptor. Uh, maybe some of the caracaras, I know some people pronounce it caracara, uh, but caracaras are kind of playful too. But other than that, you usually don't see that sort of behavior with raptors. It was noted uh, there was one individual, well, there was a pack that was near um, one of the landfills in Arizona, and one individual, a uh, young female, had found like a shredded Barbie doll in the landfill, and it would carry that with. <laughs> and it was like, okay, that literally is a toy. <laughs> but they were just, it was like this weird thing. So you do, uh, um, in survival, it, you don't have time to, to play much. But if you're an efficient hunter, efficient getting your food, you have more time to develop strange things like that. If you're hunting as a pack, you definitely have more free time because uh, the survival is not as dire. With these Harris socks, if you're looking at their legs, their legs are extremely long and gangly. Their feet are longer than the toes of most bootios. Um, and most individual Harris Hawks have toes also a bit longer than most occipiters. Uh, they're very powerful, but if you took a Harris Hawk and a red-tailed hawk of the same dimensions, red-tailed hawk has a much more powerful grip, but still Harris Hawks have incredible gripping power and their, their prey range, what do they hunt? Anything, anything, like whatever they feel like it. We normally like to think of them as mammal hunters. Uh, most of the, when I, anytime I've read any survey that's been done, like a nesting survey where you have biologists, field biologists actually observing, what are they bringing back to the nest? It was assumed it would be mostly rodents and rabbits. Uh, but by the numbers, there it was mostly birds, rather amazingly. Uh, a lot of small birds were being hunted in Arizona by these, by these packs. Now they do hunt reptiles. They do hunt uh, rodents. And they do hunt larger uh, rodentia, lagomorphs, you know, cocktails, jackrabbits, things like that. In falconry, most falconers use them to hunt uh, jackrabbits and cocktails. They're very good at that, and it's it seems like a good good match of, of predator and prey. But it's always good to remember that they are capable bird hunters. It's never quite to the level of an occipiter. 
If you took a goshawk and Harris Hawk at the same dimensions, the goshawk is going to outperform as far as speed and agility. But it is comparable. It is definitely, definitely comparable. I mentioned before about uh, just about how the taxonomy is not what you would think it would be. When you look at these birds, they're dark. They're, you know, they don't seem. You know, their their tails are long. They, their wings are short, but not super short. Where, where on earth do they belong? If you look at their head, at first glance, if you look closely, or if you take a proper picture and look closely, at the head of a Harris hawk, you might be, <clears throat> oh, they look like a miniature golden eagle. Um, it's interesting because they have been crossed with golden eagles, and they're fertile, completely fertile. Uh, this has been done in Canada. Uh, it's kind of interesting in falconry uh captive breeding of birds of prey was pioneered in the united states and done basically to help save the wild peregrine populations that were endangered falconers pioneered breeding programs and released falcons into the wild but as we have done that uh that is why most raptors used in falconry today probably over half in the long term are actually captive bred a lot of people don't know that but in america there is a lot of falcons that are bred and hybridized not a lot of hawks now over in europe even though that's not where captive breeding was pioneered they do a little bit of everything and so we see a lot of hawk hybrids happening hybrids happening over in europe that we don't see in america the uh pictures i showed of the harris hawk golden eagle hybrid this was in canada that this was done this has not been done in the united states so that would that that's not my point that they're related to eagles i'll get to the eagle thing in a minute but it is interesting if a golden eagle and a harris hawk can produce a fertile offspring a fertile viable offspring so what are they related to but they've also with some frequency been crossed with ferruginous hawks well ferruginous hawk is budio so if you're crossing those two then you were like, well, we said it was a parabudio, but it can breed with, with the budio and produce fertile, viable offspring? Her. Well, so golden eagle, Fruji. But it's also they've also been crossed with occipiters. Uh, they've been crossed with Cooper's hawks and Goss hawks. And again, they are fertile. Now, the, the when, I, I mentioned this for a few reasons, but one of the things you got to know, when, when you're growing up and you're learning about biology, taking a course in biology, usually they'll say something like, well, you know, part of what defines you as a species is whether or not you will interbreed with this other closely related thing. And even if you do, it's not going to produce fertile offspring. And the, the example of a mule is usually brought up. A horse and a donkey are close relatives, but they're not the same species. And even if they do breed, a mule can't breed. So there you go. <clears throat> well, all falcons can interbreed and produce completely fertile offspring. All falcons. Tiny little kestrel and a jeer falcon are capable of producing fertile offspring. So that is how technically closely related all falcons are. So we're really familiar with falcons and hybridizing of falcons. Falcons hybridize in the wild. That we know of many species that do with fair frequency. Peregrines and prairies do. We know sakers and jeer falcons uh, often do lanner falcons and lagger falcons often do hawks do as well uh we've had a lot of times in america where rough-legged hawks and red-tailed hawks have hybridized we've had many times in america back east where red-shouldered hawks and red-tailed hawks have hybridized so you always have these things happen hybridization is usually nature's form of extinction insurance if you can't find a mate and there's somebody that you can produce fertile offspring with and pass on your dna well there you go extinction insurance your dna has been passed on in a an, an unexpected form so we do see that happening and as humans we try to no 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 you must only be the species and occasionally you'll have government intervening and be like whoa we have a hybrid of some kind we can't have that we have to catch it and either euthanize it or put it in a zoo and it's like well it's what nature was doing so if nature's doing hybrids you know why are you trying to control nature's answer to extinction insurance? But I'm getting a little off track. ADD, that's what happens. So I just bring this up to say, to again, kind of pose the question, what on earth is a Harris hawk if I understand a falcon breeding with a falcon or something like a red tail and a red shoulder? Okay, but if 
if a Harris hawk can breed with a golden eagle, a ferruginous hawk, and a goshawk, then what on earth is it? Well, you got to go back to the tropics to understand. Because all the rest of its family, well, almost all the rest of its family, you got to find in Latin America. Okay? And remember, the Harris Hawks range is barely pushed up into the southernmost part of the United States. Barely, barely, barely. So what is it? In Utah, the closest relative of the, of the Harris Hawk is the common black hawk. I usually just call them black hawks. Now, you'll, people will talk about the species and uh, it's a species I'm very passionate about. Uh, most people know of two or three nests. Uh, the most famous one is probably a Lytle Ranch. There's one at Gunlock Reservoir and there's one in Zion. But I went out and did my own survey and found 15 nests. Uh, this is a very strange species. Common does not mean common. When you're, when, when you're talking about common names, if you hear something common, it means lesser, typically. Not always, but typically. So if you see common fill in the blank, keep looking because somewhere else there's probably a great or greater. And there is. The common black hawk means, well, there's a great black hawk that's bigger. And this is pretty much the same thing, but smaller. So you could call it the smaller black hawk because there's a great black hawk. But the common black hawk we have here in Utah in limited numbers. This is a species that is very misunderstood by most people. They are mostly hunting aquatic prey. They prefer to hunt crayfish at, further from the south in the ranges, crabs. But here in Utah, they're usually hunting crayfish and regular fish. They will hunt lizards, they will hunt mammals and rodents, but they prefer to nest near water. And they're usually in cottonwood groves. This species is also highly misunderstood because most people think they have a short tail. If you see illustrations or most field guides, they depict it with this tiny stumpy tail. Not true. They have a very long tail, just like a Harris hawk, but they have very, very, very long secondaries. So long that when the wings are folded up, that the black hawk looks like it has a stumpy tail. Why do you need, why do you need uh, ridiculously long secondaries? If you're hunting over water and you're going to catch something in the water, if you slow down, you lose all your lift. And then at that moment that you pick up your prey in the water, you've added weight. And so you're, oh, you're going to fall in the water. By extending the wing surface area with longer secondaries, a black hawk doesn't look quite right. You know, it, it looks like it has a short tail. But again, long tail long wings, ridiculously broad wings that when they're folded up, that the secondary is folded or as long as the primary stick out, basically. So this species, nobody ever talks about. Nobody ever talks about. Look at the head. Look at the head shape. It's a little different. You have a little bit of white here, you know, under the eye instead of uh, kind of the yellow we see on Harris hawks. But this is the closest cousin in Utah. Now, this family is called the Budiogallus family. And it consists of the, some of the hawks you'll hear in this family are the common black hawk that we already mentioned, the great black hawk, the savanna hawk, and a whole number of others like the Cuban black hawk and the Rufus crab hawk. So they're all in this family. They're all mostly black. Uh, some of them have some red, some pretty red. Um, but... All of these are technically small eagles. The kings or queens of this family are the black solitary eagle and the crested solitary eagle. Now, uh, common names, like I said earlier, change. All of my books that I grew up with, the black solitary eagle. Now it's the montane solitary eagle, apparently. Uh, it's basic, it's long-legged, just like everybody in this family. I don't know, it's basically the size of a golden eagle, but long-legged and lorpy. Okay, and the the crested the solitary eagle similar. It's almost as big as a golden eagle, but with these lurpy legs. All of this family. Why do they have these lurpy legs? Well, almost all of them use it. Well, there's, there's two really good things about uh, long legs if you're a bird. One is a side effect, which is heat dispersion. You got a lot of blood going to that feet, and so there's a surface area free of feathers where you have that. Uh, which is also why you end up seeing things like urohydration in American, in New World vultures, but I'm not getting into that because I'm going to get off on another tangent. But those long legs, the primary reason that most of this family uses them for is hunting water prey. Okay? 
Or if you're in, and especially most of these guys are hunting crabs or, or, or shellfish. And so if you're in mud, you're in mangrove tangles, or chunk, 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 you're walking through, those long legs really help you because they keep your feathers dry. Okay, same thing. If you're going to skim the water to grab something out of the water, long legs help you grab something without getting pulled into the water. So that is why you see this. Well, that is the uh, assumed reason of why this adaptation of these long, gangly legs comes about. Now, Harris hawks still have this as well. Okay, but Harris hawks use it. Uh, you know, they have it, so it's good for heat dispersion. But it's also really good for running on dry land. Harris hawks are surprisingly fast runners. And I got to tell you a story that there's a Harris hawk that I still have that uh, I think she's like 22 years old this year. She's captain bred. And we were hunting one time. They're hunting down uh, by Payson, Utah. And we saw a pheasant. She went after it. She chased it into a giant bush. And uh, so she went and landed on top of the bush. And I ran up to the bush. And she went, jumped down on the ground on the other side. And she went running around the bush, running around the bush, running around the bush, top speed. And she was like looking in and, and she And the pheasant's just sitting in the center, looking at me, looking at her, looking at me. And she's like, she's like, dah, dah. she kept looking up at me, like, do something, Ben. And finally, she charged in, ran into the bush, full speed. And the pheasant was like, Bleh! and went running to me in my hands. And I'm like, I caught this pheasant. I'm like, ah, uh, okay. So I get out of the bush and she flies up and over, lands on my shoulder, lands on my head, lands on my, and squawking at me. She's like, we got it. We got it. You know? And I'm like, well, this is unusual. So I just took some meat from my bag and gave it to her. And, and when she wasn't looking, set the pheasant free. It felt kind of weird, but it was, it was, it was interesting to see her hunting on foot. Now I have seen, uh, the wild Harris Hawks though in Arizona, will hunt on foot regularly. When you're in cactus country, prairie knows every plant is spiky and dangerous and mean. If I hide in here, something can't die from above. And Harris hawks are like, okay, fine. Then I'll go on ground and they'll run around. They're just like little feathered velociraptors diving in and out of the brush and out of the cacti, catching their prey. Which is really, really kind of pretty amazing. So uh, we see that, we see Another interesting thing that we also see, because remember, they are from this Buteogallus eagle line, which again, the Montane solitary eagle, the crown solitary eagle, those are top dogs of this, this uh, family of Buteogallus, right? You look at them, you're like, yeah, clearly that's an eagle. But then all the others are like this size, and then you have some that are this size. But all of them come from that eagle family line. And so there's things you would expect with most of them. One of them is a long molt. Most raptors, every year, I got a new set of feathers. Oh, I'm a first year bird. Here's my first year colors. Oh, now next year I molted, ba-boom, adult colors. And then every ba-boom, you're getting a new set of adult colors every year. That's not how Buteo Gallus works. They all have a three to five year molt, just like, just like eagles, okay? So, you know, like a bald eagle takes five years to get its white head. Same thing. This family will have these intermediate molts. Now, Harris hawks branched off earlier from the whole rest of the family tree. So if here's the Buteo Gallus family tree, Harris hawks are like, wee, off over here. Comparable, if you will, to kestrels. Falcons are a very closely related family tree, but we know that kestrels branched off way early. And all kestrels everywhere in the world have some similarities, but you can tell, oh, you guys, you guys branched off early. Gotcha. But Harris hawks still, especially the wild ones, captive bred, it's a little different. They get into a cycle, but the wild ones almost all have a three-year molt. So they have their first year colors, very streaked. And then their second year colors, one patch in the middle of the secondaries will stay and, and the rest will change. And then their third year, they get it all. They get their adult colors. One thing they did not get, usually with raptors, the bigger you are, the smaller your clutch of eggs. So like most eagles only have two eggs and maybe only one hatches or survives. Uh, condor will have one egg and it might not even be every year. It might be every few years. Uh, but then you have things like Cooper's hawk and have five eggs every year. All right, there's a 2020, I was monitoring a Cooper's hawk nest that had seven but it's a much smaller bird. Live fast, die young, right? So you gotta have produce enough offspring to replace you. Well, the Buteo Gallus 
family tree, almost all of them will have one egg every other year. Now, Harris hawks are an exception to this. Most Harris hawks will have three to five eggs. But remember, Harris hawks are pack hunters. And so it makes sense if you're if you're not just you're not trying to just produce your genetic replacement. You're tr trying to make the genetic replacement of a pack. So it's like, hey, we always have to have new blood coming into this pack, right? So they do have a larger clutch. So that is unusual. But they branched off the family tree earlier, and it is has been noted that usually the clutch sizes are larger with the more extreme deserts, desert Harris Hawks of like Arizona, Texas, and Mexico than a lot of the South American ones. That doesn't make sense because you would think, oh, where there's a lot of food, we can afford to have a larger clutch. And where food and resources are strained, we're gonna have a smaller clutch. And yet we see the opposite. So to the thinking of biologists, that would indicate that the clutch size of a Harris Hawk is much more about whether or not you come from a Harris Hawk line that is pack hunting centered as opposed to more uh, sedentary hunting and, and that's just how that kind of goes which I think is pretty pretty neat the feathers don't seem to change radically uh, Harris Hawks again I mentioned are kind of streaked but it, it seems like as they become an adult there are very strange morphs that appear so in other words you should have a first year colors an intermediate color and then an adult color, and every year you just replace that adult color. But there's something very strange that happens where random bars appear and then disappear. So having worked with Harris Hawks for a number of years, I'll see, oh, this year you have two deck feathers in the middle of your tail that have white stripes all the way down. And then the next year, you don't get them. And the years after that, you never get them again. So like no stripes, no stripes, no stripes, stripes. And same thing where you'll just get some random white feathers on the head or on the shoulders that appear and then disappear. Don't know what that is. But what we do see again is that this manifests much more in the northern Harris Hawks than the, south, than the central and South American Harris Hawks. Because again, uh, evolution streamlines species. Uh, and so you see a more streamlined species that is predictable in the plumage with the South American birds, where the, the further north you go, it seems like you do get these interesting glitches, these interesting genetic expressions that we don't see elsewhere. But every Harris hawk in the New World will have extremely flexible feathers. The tails, if you, if you grab a tail of a Harris hawk in the middle, you can bend it completely around in a U shape. Highly unusual. Most hawks have bendable feathers. Eagle, uh, golden eagles have most golden eagles. If you grab in the right place, you can bend it in a U shape as well. But most feathers are bendable, <clears throat> but brittle. And Harris hawks are not that way. You just bend them around. This slows them down. So if they're they're you know that creates drag. The more <laughs> you have, the more drag you have. Okay. So they are fast. They'd be much faster if their feathers were a bit more brittle, like a goshawk. But the good thing about that is, if you if you think about it, if you're a predator and you are in control of your body, and that's it, okay, and you're chasing the prey, and you're trying so it's you and the prey and the environment, that's it. And you're navigating, and once you have your prey, you have to, okay, I gotta keep that prey from kicking my face or biting back, but I also have to subdue them, okay? That's pretty cut and dry. There's a lot going on, but it's pretty cut and dry. The second you do that as a pack, suddenly you you got other predators coming in, burr, burr, you can't control them, and you don't have full control of the prey. So there's a 17-pound white-tailed jackrabbit kicking all over the place and scratching, and you got five other Harris Hawks coming in. What do you do? Uh, my mom always used to say, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not get bent out of shape. And I think that's true with feathers. Feathers that are bendable won't break. They might slow you down a little bit, but it's a it's a worthy trade-off because bendable feathers are less likely to break. And if you have a dog pile of a five Harris Hawks, that's an important thing. This is true somewhat on the secondaries, but all of their primaries and all of their secondaries are extremely flexible and very resilient. To the point that we, we have a process um, 
in wildlife rehab and in falconry where if a bird breaks a feather you can take a previously molted feather and cut it where the break is on the other one and take a little piece of a shaft of bamboo glue it in the shaft glue it in the other shaft and boo, now you have a repaired feather that will last until the next season when the bird molts out and gets a brand new one now, goshawks are notoriously bad on their feathers. They're notorious at being reckless hunters and breaking a feather. And, you know, sometimes rather than replacing a goshawk tail feather with a goshawk, I'm like, you keep breaking them. I'm replacing it with a Harris hawk tail feather because that way you, you're not going to break it because it's so bendable and it works well. Gets them through the end of the season. They molt it out and get a new one. It's kind of a, kind of a cool way to handle things. It's like an upgrade uh, just just for the end of a season. That's kind of neat. Now, of course, I need to address Harris Hawks in falconry. I know there's all kinds of mixed uh, thoughts on falconry. Falconry came about as a way to get food, a way for people to get dinner, right? Before there were even bows and arrows, it was a way that people hunted and could get a guaranteed meal. And that's how it started. And in the earliest of days, thousands of years ago, perhaps as far back as 10,000, we actually have an archaeological site that leads us to believe that there may have been jeer falcons being trained as far back as just under 10,000 years. But uh, beyond that, the sacred falcon of the Middle East and the peregrine falcon and the goshawk were always heralded as these are species that really put falconry on the map and allowed people to, in a very productive and consistent way get their dinner and even though all kinds of forms of falconry have been tried all over the world for thousands of years the harris hawk is always billed as the species that well in the past six thousand years nothing's revolutionized falconry more than a harris hawk uh it's one of the only if not the only bird from the new world that is used all over captive bred in the old world now, the reason is, you think about the mentality of a Harris hawk. Again, they're pack hunters. So are humans. If you have a group of humans going out hunting, you know, picture some hunter-gatherers back in the day. Three to five of you go out, and, all right, okay, what are we going to get? We're going to go hunting, right? And that's the way wolves are, too. And we domesticated wolves into hunting dogs and then into pugs and poodles and all kinds of other things, but, but originally into hunting dogs. And wolves are like, hey, hey this works great. Oh, you, we're, we got the same way of thinking. Harris hawks are the same way. Harris hawks are wolves of the sky. They are, they work in packs. They have a hierarchy. They understand uh, they understand a hierarchy of sharing. They understand teamwork. And so training Harris hawk is the easiest thing on earth. They work so well and they really enjoy it. The way most falconers hunt with their Harris hawks is they just walk away. They just, ju which is the same thing as Harris Hawks under the wild. So you get your birds out of your truck and you just start walking away. And they're like, okay, I guess we're going that direction. They start following along the land on trees and they're like, I think he's going that way. I'm going to fly ahead of him. And then if he's walking any rabbits, he's going to scare him up and I'll catch him. And they just, you're just going for a walk and your Harris Hawks are just following with you, having the time of their lives, getting some good exercise, chasing things. If you catch something, you stop. And if you don't, you circle around. And like for me at the end, I'm like, go back to the truck. And they're like, Meep. and they know, go back to the truck and then just go land on it. It's really very neat. And so again, a species that all over the world is well known. We haven't had a problem with, with uh, Harris Hawks doing that, with uh, them going in the wild in areas they shouldn't be. Same thing in the United States. Because they're pack hunters and because they're so loyal, it's, it's almost impossible to lose a Harris Hawk. They, they, don't, they don't want to be lost. They want to, they're like, where'd you go? But it is true in England, there are a few Harris Hawks that, I don't know the whole situation, but are living wild. And again, remember what's extinction insurance? Find an animal to hybridize with if you can't find your own kind. And so there's a few Harris Hawks in England that are happily living uh, and have common buzzards, which is somewhat similar to a red-tailed hawk as their mate and are producing offspring and it's like okay uh, and but i think it's more interesting because you know it does get cold in the winter in england and these harris hawks seem to handle that just fine where we normally think of them as very much a warm weather or tropical weather bird and yet here there are living in the wild in england and doing just fine
So that's kind of a crash course on Harris Hawks. Uh, I hope you enjoyed learning about them. I hope you maybe learned a new thing or two about them. If you ever get a chance to see them hunting as a pack in the wild, I highly recommend you jump on that opportunity because it's one of the most amazing things to witness in the wild. Uh, if you if you like this video, uh, I do a lot of uh, videos on raptors and on falconry on my YouTube channel. You can always check that out. Just look up Ben Woodruff on YouTube. And they're just like this. They're very casual. I try to make them fun. and and teach different things about uh, birds of prey. And uh, But uh, thank you so much for coming out and supporting uh, the Great Salt Lake Bird Festival online. And I hope you all have great luck in the field finding the species that you hope to see.